1 Peter 4. Epistle of 1 Peter, chapter 4. It's good to be back in God's house today. I hope that you've all come here praying for the service. <clears throat> we want to welcome those of you that are visiting this morning. We hope that we'll make you feel welcome in a way that you'd like to come back and be with us again. I know we have uh, some that are out today, some due to sickness, some traveling. <clears throat> we certainly want to continue to remember them. We do have a, a thank you card to the church. Let me go ahead and read that, lest I forget. Uh, this is the family of Gracie Williams Broom. It acknowledges with deep appreciation your kind expression of sympathy. To Long Star Baptist Church, Brother Long and members, thank you so much for your kindness in sending flowers for Mother's funeral. The arrangement, the arrangement was beautiful. Your thoughtfulness meant so much to us, Daryl and Sarah Broom, Josh and Drew, and H.D. Broom. So, of course, this is from Brother J.C.'s sister's family. Now, when you think about the epistle of 1 Peter, uh, there's one particular word that occurs over and over in this book, and that's the word suffering. And uh, every chapter, you can go back and look every chapter in this particular epistle, uh, there's something about suffering. And let me clarify even what he means there by suffering. All people suffer, don't they? Everyone suffers in some way. There's those that have more suffering than others. That uh, Suffering is just part of the curse of sin that's upon humanity and upon this earth. But what Peter is really referring to here is he writes to these individuals, not just the everyday human suffering, but suffering for the cause of Christ. In fact, if you look at the beginning of this chapter in verse 1 of chapter 1, it says that Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now these people were scattered for a reason, not because that they had gone in search of work, not because that they just desired to see the world. These people were scattered, I believe, because of persecution. You can go back in the book of Acts and you can study about even those who were scattered abroad upon the persecution of, of Saul of Tarsus that came upon Stephen. And we know that Stephen was stoned to death. And, and because of that, that many people scattered, they left. And yet we know that God used that to uh, spread the gospel message. Nevertheless, just let me... As a way of background, just sort of get this on your mind, that these people were truly persecuted for the cause of Christ. The emperor at that time, the Roman emperor's name was Nero. And uh, you can go and you can study Nero, and uh, that he was a very selfish individual, and that he had a desire, his, history tells us that he had a desire to even enlarge his palace and the grounds of his palace and uh, there was nowhere to do it. The city was crowded. And so he would even have his own men set fire to the city of Rome and burn down much of the city of Rome, even having many people killed uh, so that that would free up space for him to do what he wanted to do. And because of that, that word got out that, you know, this is, Nero did this. This is his fault. And to keep the people from turning on him, he blamed it on the Christians. And he desired to annihilate God's people. He did many awful, cruel things uh, to the people of God, use very brutal means in uh, doing that. But uh, in this atmosphere that these people lived in, that Peter writes this particular epistle, and he writes this to those who are scattered. So having that thought in your mind, that these are people that know what it's like to be persecuted for being Christians, let's read some verses of Scripture. Let's actually go back and read one verse in chapter 3, uh, and then we'll go to chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, let's read verse 18. We could go back and read other verses, but uh, there, there's just so much here. I don't want to just use all my time uh, just reading this morning, although there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Peter said, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now really verses 19 through 22 are a parenthesis, it's a good parenthesis, but it's a parenthesis that Peter uh, goes and he speaks of baptism and the ministry of, of the Holy Spirit even before uh, the New Testament. But he picks up the thought in chapter 4 verse 1 concerning the fact, he just said that Christ has suffered. He suffered for sins. There's a reason he suffered. 
He was the just one, suffered for those who were the unjust, so that we could have a way to God. But he goes on in chapter 4, verse 1, and he says this, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For this cause, or for, for this cause, was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability or the strength which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happier ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. That's really the entire chapter here in 1 Peter chapter 4, and I would encourage you just to keep your Bible open. I want to go back and look at some things this morning out of this chapter. But if you want to just title the message this morning, the thought that's on my heart is this thought of choosing to suffer for Christ. I want us to think about that this morning. Choosing to suffer for Christ. Now, I think most of you know my background, you know my upbringing, and I think my upbringing would be similar to a lot of your upbringing. Uh, your daddy might not have been a preacher. I know some of, you, some of you that you had a father that was a preacher. And yet, whether your daddy was a preacher or not, a lot of you grew up learning the Bible. And I grew up learning the Bible as well. And, I, and part of learning the Bible was learning about some individuals in the Bible that faced great persecution for being Christians. And uh, I was thinking this morning that... Uh, if I were to just tell you what comes to your mind when I say of a Christian that faced persecution, a lot of times you think about Stephen, don't you? The man that was stoned to death uh, because of the fact that he preached Jesus Christ at the resurrection of the dead. There's others in the scriptures that faced great uh, persecution. We can read about James, the brother of John, who was uh, taken and that he was killed by Herod. You think about the Apostle Paul, the persecution that he faced. He, he spoke about many of those things that he went through for the cause of Christ. But it wasn't just them. In fact, the Bible speaks of even the prophets. That uh, You think about Jeremiah. You go back and study his life. A man that faced great persecution for doing nothing more than just speaking the truth of what God gave him to speak. And so I knew about all of them. And I knew about others. I'd, I'd heard of those around the world that... Uh, in, in certain countries, in certain areas, a lot of times third world type countries. Countries to where that maybe that there was a certain religion that was opposed to Christianity and that the ruling, uh, maybe a ruling family or a ruling party 
that they enforced religious law there. And I knew that there were Christians that were being persecuted in those places. I understood that. And I want to go a step further. Brother Rodney, I felt, at least since I've been old enough to understand and study the Word of God and, and sort of see the direction that this country is going, I believed, Brother Rodney, that there would come a time in our country that we would face some trouble uh, because that we were Christians. But I'm going to be honest with you this morning, and I'm not going to preach a political message at all this morning. I'm just trying to set a stage. I've always felt like that that was decades away. I've always felt like that that was something that maybe my grandchildren or great-grandchildren would have to face one day if they lived in this country. Uh, that they'd have to face the time where it would not be hard for them to stand up for the Lord, hard for them to be a Christian. But I don't, re I don't mean to just take a knee-jerk reaction to things either. But I believe that we can all see by the things that are taking place, even things that, and it's just in the last few months, how far have we gone in this nation? That there was a time that there's always been a fringe element of people that's been opposed to God, even here in this nation, even in the South, even in the Bible Belt. There was always a, 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 a small minority, and they were not very vocal about it because they were in the minority. But you see here just... Well, just in the past weeks and in the past months that it's not just a fringe element anymore, is it? There's many that in the book of Psalms chapter 2, the Bible speaks of those uh, who hate Jesus Christ. In fact, that listen, to, listen to the statement that uh, David made. It's actually quoted again in the, the New Testament concerning uh, them in our day. We are living in the last days. We are living in perilous times. Uh, but listen to how that uh, the ungodly described in Psalm chapter 2. He said, why do the heathen rage? We're seeing that, aren't we? The, the heathen, the ungodly, the unsaved, those uh, who have no fear of God, they're, they're raging today, aren't they? Uh, they're, they're raging. You go and you listen to, uh, again, I'm not, I, I'm not trying to get into politics, but those that are even... People that are facing uh, hearings, people that are facing, uh, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, uh, they've, they've had their name proposed to certain offices and they have to go before a house or the Senate and they're, they're, they're facing those hearings to be confirmed, confirmation hearings, what I'm trying to think of. You think of even questions that they're being posed. You think of those that are, uh, are, are trying to get them to even denounce their faith, aren't they? I heard just recently that uh, one particular politician in Washington would make the statement that he would ask uh, one of these men that was facing confirmation to a certain political position, and he would ask him his stance concerning different things that the Bible spoke of. And uh, really the man just made the statement that, uh, that I'm, I'm a, I am a, a God-fearing man, I am a child of God, I do believe in Jesus Christ, and that politician would make the statement that he said, based on the answers that this man's given, that this man is unqualified to serve our nation. Now, you think about that, and uh, the fact that, that now that is no longer a fringe element, but they're being very emboldened, aren't they, to speak out against Christ, to speak out against the Lord. But he went on, he said in Psalm chapter 2, here's what the heathen would say, let us break their bands asunder. Whose bands? It says the bands of the Lord and His Son against God and Christ. Let's break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, having said all that, I believe this. I believe the time is approaching very rapidly that we're going to begin to face substantial persecution as the people of God. And I don't believe that I would get a lot of opposition I've been saying that this morning. I may have 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, but probably not uh, today. And what do we all say? Well, maybe the Lord's going to come back. It would not hurt my feelings if the Lord came back today. I'm ready. Uh, I worry about those that are not ready. But listen to what I'm about to say. 
what makes us any better than Stephen? What makes us any better than Jeremiah? What makes us any better than James? What makes us any better than these people in Peter's day? That somehow that we're entitled not to face any kind of suffering and persecution for the cause of Christ is really about, that's about what we're saying when we say, well, hopefully the Lord's going to come back before then. You know what we're saying? I really don't want to. I, I really don't want to deal with what they've dealt with. I don't really feel like I deserve it. I'm entitled maybe to a better life than these people faced. Well, we're not, are we? I don't think we're any better than these men. As a matter of fact, I feel like that probably their spirituality, you know, in a lot of ways was much greater than ours is. I talked to a couple just recently and they told me of an experience that they had. We're coming back here to 1 Peter 4, so just hold your place there. They told me an experience they had just recently in Hattiesburg that uh, a group of them from their church were at a restaurant and that before they ate, that they did as they always do, that they, as a group, that they would stop and uh, one person would be asked to say the blessing and said as they were, as that individual, I believe it was the pastor of the church, was asking the blessing, not in a rude way or a way to make everybody else stop and respect it, but just in a quiet way among themselves, that a group of people at the next table began to mock them openly while they were saying the blessing. Now, I don't know the, all the details, the circumstances around it. I don't know what kind of influence those people might have been under, but they, they were emboldened, weren't they? To mock the name of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to see more and more of that. There's something that's going to become more commonplace uh, in our society and in our day. Now, I, I said we're going to think about choosing to suffer for Christ this morning. And my mind went to a man by the name of Moses. The, what did the Bible say about Moses? He chose to suffer, didn't he? Moses chose to suffer. A man that grew up in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, he grew up in the house of Pharaoh. He was Pharaoh's daughter's son by adoption. We know that story. And yet that it said when he came to years, he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. You see, he had a choice to make. It, that choice was really an easy... Well, let, let me say, let me back up. It was not an easy choice, but the choice was between a life of ease and a life of suffering, wasn't it? You ever thought about that? If... Moses could have just kept his mouth shut. He could have believed in God. And could, he could have believed in the fact that he was a sinner and that there was a Messiah that would come. And he could have done all that in private and never said anything about it. And lived a life in the lap of luxury in the palace of Pharaoh. He could have just gone with the current, couldn't he? But he didn't do that. He chose to suffer for the cause of Christ. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can make the choice not to suffer as a child of God. You can make that choice in your life. Or, you can do as many as have gone before us have done. We can choose to suffer for the cause of Christ. It's a conscious choice that we make. That I'm not going to just go with the flow. I'm not going to uh, just get in line. And, 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 and there's a right and a wrong way to do that. But to make a choice to follow, follow the Lord. Go back to verse 1. Notice what Peter wrote here. He said, for as much. The word for as much there just means so. And it harkens us back to verse 18 of chapter 3. He said, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. 
He used the comparison here. He used the word as. He said that as Christ has suffered for us. Why did Christ suffer? It was for us, wasn't it? Though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor. On and on and on, we could look at a lot of different scriptures that talk about the fact that the reason Christ suffered was he did that for us. So that we could be saved, so that we could escape the eternal damnation, so that we could escape hell, the lake of fire. He suffered for us. He said there in verse 18 that Christ hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. You're never going to get to God any other way than through Christ. He's the only way to get you to God. He's the way. So he said, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Now look at the next phrase here. He said, arm yourselves. He said, put on some armor because there's a battle that we have to face. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about a battle that we're in. But here he said that we are to arm ourselves likewise with the same mind. The same mind. The same mind as who? As Christ. What does it mean, the same mind? It means that we're to think the same way. We're to have the same attitude as Christ had. That we're to have the same thoughts that, that Christ had concerning ourselves is what it boils down to. And, and that's what I want to get at this morning. He said, arm yourselves with that same mind. Philippians chapter 2, he said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And he talks about how that he humbled himself to come to this world and to, to do what nobody else could do. And how that God ex has exalted him to a place of preeminence now because of that. But notice this. Notice the very last phrase in verse 1. You miss this, you're going to miss it all. It says, for he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. I don't believe he's talking about Christ there because Christ had no sin to start with. Christ didn't, uh, he didn't learn how to, uh, how to give up himself and, and quit sinning and, and, and do the will of God. No, he had no sin. But he's speaking of us there. He said that we're to have the attitude that we're willing to suffer for the cause of Christ because he said he that has this attitude, when we come to the place, he said, where we're willing to suffer, it, it's not about us anymore. It's not about our, uh, our comfort. It's not about our will. It's not about our mind. It's not about us. But when we come to the place that we're willing to suffer for him, that he suffered for us, that we're willing to suffer for him, he said, we've come to the place to cease from sin. Look at verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. You... If I ask you, what's the number one problem? What's the number one problem that causes you to sin? Well, it's Satan. No, it's not Satan. It's you. You're your number one problem. I am my number one problem. In fact, listen to what John said concerning uh, our, our sin. In, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, he said, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Now, he put sin into one of three categories. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What was it all about? Me. You see, as long as we have the attitude of me first, my pleasure, my will, my life, my comfort, he said that sin is going to continue to reign in our mortal bodies. Because he said all of these things, it's about me. The original sin was about me. The original sin of, you think about Satan, as he would rebel against God, it was all about me, what I want. In the Garden of Eden, it was about what we can be. If we eat this, that we're going to be like gods. We'll be elevated to a position. We'll have the things that he's withheld from us. And so back in 1 Peter chapter 4, he said, He that suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. We're not where we need to be until we're ready to suffer for Christ. That hurts me. That, I don't know if that cuts you down. That cuts me down pretty low. 
Are you ready to suffer for Christ? He said, we've got to have that attitude. We've got to have that mindset. Because when we've come to that place, when we come to the place that I'm not so important anymore, that I'm willing to suffer, whatever it takes, I'm willing to suffer for Him because He was willing to suffer for me. He said that this can take place in our lives, verse 2, that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. You see, one of two things drives you as an individual. It's either your lust and your desires, or it's God's will. Jesus said, my need is to do His will and to finish His work, to do that that He's given me to do. Go on to verse 3. He said, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. Listen to these things, how He describes their life in the past. And this is the life of many people today. He said, when we walked in lasciviousness, lasciviousness, lasciviousness just means licentiousness. It means lack of self-control. Just if it feels good, do it. What's that all about? It's about self, isn't it? Lusts. We know what that is. That's about fulfilling our desires of the flesh. Excess of wine. Speaking of drunkenness. Revelings. My mind always goes to Mardi Gras when I hear the word revelings. Revelry. Uh, well, they, they call it down in Brazil, I, I guess it is, where, I guess the, is it Rio de Janeiro where they kind of started it, the big one? It's called Carnival down there, isn't it? You know where Carnival comes from? It comes from the word carnal of the flesh. Let's live it up because that for these next, this next period of time that we're going to have to give up some things, so let's live it up now. It's about me, isn't it? Revelings, banquetings, and abominable, abominable idolatries. You see, all of these things focus on self. And he said here that we're not, we're, we're not ready to suffer for Christ until that we've come to the place to say... Lord, not my will, but your will be done in my life. He said to come to that, to have that attitude that I'm willing to suffer for him, he said that will eliminate so, many sin, so much sin in our life because we'll no longer be focused on ourself. Go down to verse 7. All these things are tied together. He said, but the end of all things is at hand. He, he says that, you know, that... The end of time's coming. The Lord's coming back. He wrote about that in 2 Peter chapter 3 concerning the coming of the Lord. He said it's close. It's close. So he said in light of that, he said here's how we're to live. He said be ye therefore sober. Sober, and that doesn't mean just not to partake of alcohol, even though the Christian shouldn't be a partaker of that. But it means to be sober-minded, to think clearly. He said... And watch into prayer. I tell you what, prayer is an unselfish act, isn't it? Because prayer is not easy. Prayer is hard. Prayer is to give of yourself. No matter if you're praying, even if you're praying for yourself, you're still giving of yourself. He said, watch into prayer. And go down to verse 8. He said, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Charity is the love of Christ. We go back and read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He said, charity seeketh not her own. Charity doesn't look to benefit myself. But it said, charity looks on the things of others. The welfare of others. Charity desires for others to grow and to be benefited. He says, have fervent charity among yourselves. He says, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. When we have love one for another as we ought to, we'll be able to forgive and overlook a lot of things. Look at verse 9. He says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. <laughs> it's amazing how much hospitality comes up in the New Testament, isn't it? We don't think about that a lot. We're the hospitality state, I guess. We don't think about hospitality a whole lot. 
But in those days, uh, and th you know, last week as we looked at the qualifications for a preacher, one of the qualifications is that he's given to hospitality. He's a, he's a lover of guests. You see, in those days, that if a Christian traveled from place to place, that they couldn't just stay at the Holiday Inn Express. From what I understand about the inns of that day, as they were about taverns, is about all they were. They were places that were not places that you would want to spend time. A lot of people of ill, places of ill repute. And so the people of God, as they traveled, that they had to, they, they, if, if they were going to have a place to stay, it was going to have to come from God's people. You talk, talk about using hospitality. Are you a hospitable person? So that's got nothing to do with my relationship with the Lord. Here it says it does. Willing to open your, your home to other people. Willing to give of yourself. And he said not only are you to use hospitality, but he said you're to do it without grudging. That means that you're not only to do it, but you're to do it for the right reasons. Not just say, well, oh, I guess if I have to. You see, it's come to the place where it's not about us anymore. Come to the place that where the work of the Lord is more important. And then he said in verse 10, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Listen to me, child of God. You've got a gift. You have got a supernatural gift that's been given to you by God. And you're not to use that gift for yourself. That's what he says here. As every man hath received the gift. He said, even so minister the same one to another. You use that gift for the edification of others. You use that gift for the building up of the body of Christ. We... I'll just use this. We've got a lot of musical talent here in the church, and I'm so thankful for that. But that musical talent wasn't given to you so that people could pat you on the back and people could look at you. That musical talent was given to you so that you could benefit the work of the Lord with that. You can encourage people. And I'm not just picking on those that have musical ability. Whatever ability the Lord's given you, whatever gift He's given you, he said, you use it for others. He said, as a good steward of the grace of God, the grace of God, that that you didn't deserve, God gave you that. He said, use it for his glory. He went on in verse 11. He said, if any man speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. Any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God giveth. <laughs> he said, whatever you do, he said, you do it according to the strength that God supplies. For what purpose that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Today, are you willing to suffer for Christ? Have you come to the place that you've ceased from sin? Because you've said, Lord, it's your will that's important in my life, not my own. Look at what's our attitude to be towards suffering. Real quickly, let's just look at a few scriptures and then we'll close. Verse 12. He said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. That's about how we look at suffering a lot of times for Christ, isn't it? Really? Come on. Me? Well, what, Lord, why do I have to suffer for you? Why do I have to be ridiculed? Why do people talk about me? He said, don't think it's strange. When you have to suffer this way. In fact, that he would make the statement in verse 17 of chapter 3. He said, it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. You know, it's part of God's plan. Suffering's part of God's plan for us. That it, it makes us more like Christ. It matures us. It grows us. But he said our attitude ought to be this in verse 13. He said, rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. I don't know all the extent of that. But he's, I believe there's great reward for those that are willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. He said if we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. And, and he went on. 
He said in verse 14, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. You know, if we'd be honest with ourselves this morning, are you willing to suffer for Christ? We like to talk about it, don't we? But I wonder really how many of us are willing to share in the sufferings that Christ shared in. You know why we're not? Because we love ourselves too much. He said, we must come to that place where we have the same attitude that Christ had. He said, only then will we come to the place where sin doesn't have that dominion over us. But he said in verse, let's read verse 15, 16, 17. And we're going to close. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. He said, if you're suffering because you've done evil, he said, not getting anything from that. But he said, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You know, I, I hope and I pray and I trust that when it comes to us, when we truly are going to have to suffer, and we will, we're not above it. We're going to have to suffer for the cause of Christ if you choose to suffer for Him, if you choose to live for Him. I trust when that time comes that we won't be ashamed, but when it comes, we'll be willing to glorify God on that behalf. And we've come to the place where, Lord, it's... It's about your work. It's about your will. Paul would make the statement in Galatians chapter 2. Let me just read it real quick. You don't have to turn over there, but listen to what he said. Verse 20, he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Come to that place where my life is not my life, but it's Christ's life in me. He said, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of truth? You see, as we go through these fiery trials, as we suffer for the cause of Christ, he said what that is doing is that is burning the dross off of us. That is purifying us. That is getting us ready for his kingdom. So he said, if it begin here, he said, you think about the awful judgment that's going to take place for those that don't know the Lord. I had intended on going to a lot of other places this morning. My time is up. But I wonder today, are you willing to suffer for Christ? Oh, I, as I said earlier, I hope that we will be. That we'll be willing to suffer for Him. We'll be willing to stand for the Word of God, no matter what people say, no matter what names they call us, no matter what we may be um, denied the friends that we may not have, be able to keep company with anymore. He said, you know, they think it's strange that we don't run to those things. We're willing to suffer for it. The only way we're going to be willing to suffer for it is if we're willing to put ourselves in the proper place. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you know what all this means? The come to the Lord draweth nigh. He's coming. You need to be prepared. As we just read what Peter said, that Christ suffered for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. The only way that you could be brought to a saving faith or, or saving relationship with God is through his son, Jesus Christ. And I beg you and plead with you to trust him. Let's have a song. If there be something in your heart this morning.